Today is February 12th, 2018, and you're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 77. Today on the show, we are talking about Disney's new autonomous robot, Samsung's smart suit, the oath of data scientists, and more. You better pop on that smart suit, because Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. What is going on, everybody? Nick, you sound so much better this week. How are you feeling? Oh, thanks, man. I'm feeling uh, a lot better. And in fact, I felt well enough to go on a hike this weekend. Uh, and I almost... What? Very I know. Cool. I know. So my partner and I have been going out on these hikes, uh, you know, getting back in shape and New Year resolution, all that, all, all that stuff. And um, I got to say, so we're, we're novice hikers. And I, I got a shout out to this All's Trails app. Have you used that? All no, trails. what what's the what's good with the All Trails app? Uh, well, I don't know. I just I I, I just like it a lot, and I felt like I wanted to sh- shout them out. Um, it's kind of neat. There's there's a few usability issues, but for the most part, it's pretty cool. You can check in. It gives you directions to these hikes. Um, it records your hikes. You can share your hikes. You know the social media aspect of a hiking app. But man, I so I'm I'm less wanting to talk about the app and more along the psychological effect of going on these hikes I you mentioned a hike the other week right when you were talking about your leg and sort of the biomechanics of that oh yeah definitely and I totally agree with you about the mental part of the hike but what was it like for you so okay so let, let me set this straight here really quick we, we went we're we're starting to get a little bit um oh what's the word for it uh we're starting to think more of ourselves I guess <laughs> we're starting to be Trying to challenge ourselves, right? So we, we went on our first moderate hike on uh, Sunday, yesterday. And um, we're, yeah, we're recording this on a Monday. I'm still in a lot of pain. But we went on our first moderate hike yesterday that was supposed to be 6.2 miles, okay? And, and that's that's a decent hike. And for someone, especially novice, to hiking, right? I, now, I look at 800 feet elevation and I'm like... Yeah, that's no problem. And, um, you know, it might not be for most people, but this hill that we had to climb, uh, it just kept going and going. And, like, the way that you could see the plateau, you saw a plateau and you're like, oh, that's it. You get to the plateau and you see more mountain and you keep climbing and you keep climbing and every time you hit a plateau you just see higher and higher and it was re- it was more mentally and emotionally draining than actually physically draining i mean we had to stop a lot um and while i really like this app that i just mentioned the all trails app i wish it would offer a couple extra things for beginning hikers like hey we didn't bring enough water so i got super dehydrated um you know, my leg started cramping up and I was almost about to that point where I was like, okay, call in the helicopter because I'm not making it out of this thing. And also, uh, you know, it could provide a couple extra sort of hints uh, for your hike. Like, okay, this was a 6.2 mile hike, right? I said that? Yeah. At one point, we took a wrong turn and it turned into an eight mile hike. Woo! Yeah, that's no joke, especially when you're talking about going up elevation too. Yeah, and yeah. And there was additional elevation and the little detour that we did. So, um, but that was, that was all cool. And, you know, I got, I got my VR camera out and was able to take some panorama pictures. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy I did it. We, we kicked ass. So happy for that. But I mean, still there's, there's gotta be, uh, just, just the sort of barriers to entry for novices, I think is, is worth talking about. But what about you, Blake? What's going on with you? Oh man. Well, now I can walk. And but listening to you talk makes my leg hurt, to be honest. <laughs> uh, but no, this week I kind of took it easy. Um, but I have been working on this thing called the Spaced Challenge. So it was a uh, it was a challenge that was put out by this uh, UX freelance designer who was working with like GoPro and Nike for designing some of their brand 
websites and stuff like that. And he, what he had done is just basically put out on YouTube a challenge to create a website, mobile app, and a logo for a company called Space. That was there was like a fictional space travel company. Sure. Um, and so there was like thousands and thousands of entries and all that kind of stuff. But it was a, it was just a lot of fun to kind of like flex some of my design muscles and put some of the human factors background that I have to do, you know, kind of competitive analysis and all that kind of stuff together. So it just, that's what I spent most of my Sunday doing instead of, you know, going for a hike. I was sitting on my butt playing with my computer. Uh, but yeah, so, that's how I spent most of Sunday. So I got to ask, your logo was obviously the moon man in a Tesla Roadster, right? Yeah, so that's the funny part is he actually gave round one of feedback and had all these things they didn't want and they wanted a, I wanted everybody to stick away from some of the cliche, uh, you know, space things like people in astronauts rocket ships uh they just wanted to focus more on like a branding thing because originally yeah i did have like an astronaut and i was doing some stuff with <laughs> them being like attached to the space x dragon and all that kind of stuff so i uh, you finished your design or is this still going i did i finished it and turned it in or put it on social media all that kind of good stuff so it's on twitter right now uh, yeah, it's on Twitter and Behance and Dribble, all those places you can find those design-y type things. Do you see what I did there? I just uh, I just made everybody go to your Twitter. To, oh, you're the because man. Because I'm not asking you what it is. I, I'm, I'm telling everybody to go to your Twitter to see what it is. I'm oh, actually... Oh, Nick, you're so sneaky. Yeah, I know. He's, I wouldn't have even known. <laughs> see what I do? Oh, man. I, you know... It's fun. I'm I'm actually trying to look up your Twitter handle right now to see what it is. <laughs> but Nick, you've got to tell me about this second bullet you got on here because we can't go past that. Uh, you know, okay. So this, okay. I didn't want to mention this. I put it on there just as like extra if I didn't rant enough about the uh, the hike. But here's here's the thing. So they, everyone knows that I'm. A Star Wars guy, and they announced the Star Wars Hotel a while back. But they released a couple. Um, they they released a couple more details today about sort of this hotel that is going to be sort of this all inclusive experience where you dress up and you go on missions and you are actually engulfed in the Star Wars universe, much akin to sort of the Westworld experience. Um, and I don't know. I just thought that it's crazy that we are living in a world where not only where TV influences TV and movies influence um, your life, but also how it informs design. Right. So I'm sure they were planning this immersive experience for a very long time. But now Westworld is back in sort of everyone's collective consciousness, um, especially with the Super Bowl ad. And I'm 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 sure uh, can we say Super Bowl? Because I, I heard some people saying that... Anyway, we're not paid. Anyway, the Super Bowl ad and, uh, you know, the the whole thing of this immersive experience, I think they wanted to capitalize that. So they released today that, you know, it'll be connected to the Galaxy's Edge Star Wars land. And when you go out into this land, um, your missions will continue. And that way, like, it's just this complete immersive experience. And I'm so excited to try it out. But... Um, you know, it, it's really funny because even though I'm a huge Star Wars fan, there's no way I'm going to this thing within the first six months of it launching because it's just going to be nuts. Oh, man, I can only imagine it being super insane. But I had heard nothing about this, and it sounds like a lot of fun and pretty challenging experience to design and give people. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I'm, they're talking about developing a whole land for this. I'm sure adding a hotel with some extra experiences is nothing for them. That's awesome. Yeah, man. Well, you know what I want to talk about? Our Slack blew up this week. We got a lot of really good discussion out there, and I just want to thank and welcome Mawa for joining our Slack channel. Um, and I just want to bring up a couple points, but there's there's a ton of other discussion on there, on our news stories, on topics like the Olympics, drone show. There's a ton of interesting little tidbits that you can get uh, uh, varying perspectives from a wide variety of different human factors practitioners in there but a couple points that i want to bring up uh so mateo on last week's episode uh i want to bring up his comment on this he said great discussion today got me thinking about the project we have in progress down under at the moment uh with atc called one sky and they're trying to unify 
uh, air traffic control between civilian and military. And I wanted to bring this to you, Blake. Um, did you see this comment? And what do you think about this concept of unifying civilian and military uh, air traffic control? Ooh, no, I didn't see this comment, but this is a really cool concept. The I, I wonder what is really entailed here, because when, when you said that, the immediate thing that popped into my mind is it doesn't sound like the best idea, but it would depend on the context, right? That's where like I was it, at, too, right? And I'd yeah, be, I, yeah. I need to reach out to Mateo and just kind of pull the thread on this, because it sounds like a really cool concept. Yeah, obviously it's needed, because if you think about it, like I live right next to, uh, what is it, Miramar Air Force Base, and planes are going off up and down all the time. So you've got to imagine there's some communication between, you know, what's going on at the air base versus what's going on down at just San Diego Airport. But I just, obviously there's a gap in some kind of communication for people in Australia, and I'm sure it exists here. But, I mean, but just given my two cents on it, I think it's probably a good idea, at least to make their communication more seamless, maybe. Uh, what it means by unifying, I'm not really sure. But the part that worries me is, like, if what in what vein does this work? So is it keeping everything that's, like, in a much more operational context, like a deployed context, keeping it out of the way? That That's my only kind of concern, right? Um, and I don't, I don't know what the how things function in australia and i don't understand why what the need really is yeah but nick what do you think i don't know i'm i'm kind of with you blake i mean because here in the states we have sort of these restricted airspaces around military bases and that's kind of free reign for them to play if you will and then um you know commercial air traffic is uh far away and they kind of avoid these spaces um, intentionally, so that way they don't get in the military's way. And I'm wondering if it's um, I, I just don't I just don't know enough about the domain to really speak knowledgeably about it. And and you know what? I'm going to reach out to Mateo. And if you guys want to get the answer to this, you can jump in our Slack. Our link is in our show notes. You see what I did there? I'm creating a discussion, and now I'm pulling everybody into the Slack. I... <laughs> You're the man, Nick. Oh, You're thanks. Just a master. Also in the Slack, you can share events. Did you like that transition? Uh, and uh, we also have another event in the Slack. So if you guys are down under, specifically in Perth, uh, there is a Perth, Australia. There is a 2018 Hive Intern Showcase where 10 interns will provide an overview of their work, uh, followed by demonstrations on the Hive screens. And if you haven't seen these Hive screens, they're they're kind of immersive displays that are these uh, these curved. Um, Almost cave-like. When I say cave, I mean the the virtual environment cave uh, displays that that uh, have different visualization on visualizations on them, and there's there's a lot of different um, things to be seen there. Uh, one of our Slack members is actually going, um, and uh, so the event details. It's this Friday, February sixteenth, uh, twenty eighteen, from nine a.m. to four p.m., and it's at uh, Curtain Hive. John Curtin Gallery, Building 200A, Curtin University. And you can check in our Slack for more details on that. Hey, Blake, do you have any events to bump this week? Yeah, I've got one plug. So all week from tomorrow through Friday, I think it's about like running from 9 to about 2.30 every day, is UX Pins Virtual Summit. And this whole week is all about building design systems, whether it's building an actual one, implementing in your company, or lessons learned from people like uh, some of the product designers at LinkedIn, stuff like that. It's just talks all day. And the nice thing is it's free and all of the uh, sessions are going to be webinars. So you can check them out online. Well, that's that's excellent. I may have to check this out. Are the sessions recorded? Can we check them out later? That I don't know. Somebody actually asked me that in Slack today and I couldn't f- figure out the answer. But if they are, I'll be sure to make sure to post them in our Slack. So make sure you get in there and See them if you would like them, but uh, we'll also I'll also put out the link for UX Pin again in the Slack, but also on Twitter, so everybody can have access to it in case you have some free time or if you typically listen to podcasts at work. This might be a good way to spend some of your time. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, with that being said, I got I got a little surprise for our listeners tonight. We're trying to freshen up the show a little bit, so let us know what you think about this. All right, this is the part of the show all about Human Factors news. This is where we talk about everything related to the field of Human Factors. This could be anything from medical transportation, psychology, 
AI, whatever it is, you name it, as long as it relates to the field of human factors, it is fair game. Blake, what do we got up first this week, aside from the six sound beats? Oh, man, the sickest beats ever. Uh, but so this week, or I guess last week it was, so there was a passenger aircraft that was carrying about 65 passengers and six crew members that actually crashed near Moscow last week. So the AN-148 aircraft, suspicious, kind of insanely, disappeared from radar within two minutes of taking off from the Moscow airport. An emergency service services source told the TASS news agency that there were actually no survivors, as unfortunate as that is. So Russian media reports the crew could not get to the site by vehicle they actually had to go by foot and again the task news agency added that russian authorities have confirmed that fragments of the aircraft were found for about 25 miles around the moscow airport now nick there was a lot of speculation about what was going on here but a lot of people are thinking it's related to of course some sort of human error yeah, and you know what? I just realized something. We need to plan these better because that was really upbeat music, and you start really on a downer. So, I mean, let's... <laughs> Bummer. But, but, yeah, no, I... So, I posted this story with the, the, the sort of first inklings that it may be human error. And um, there, as of now, as of time, the time we are recording, who knows, this could go up, and then they, they release something five minutes later. But as of the time we are recording, there has been... Uh, no confirmation that it was human error, and I was hoping that we could talk about sort of the cause of this this event. Um, but instead, I feel like this is more of a, a public service announcement, if you will, to talk about how important it is to sort of design for the um, design for the human, and and you know it's it's sort of it's super crucial to 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 design for the human in these cases where preventing the loss of life is necessary, right? Yeah. In cases like air traffic control or it, it being a pilot or even a crew member, like the, the interfaces that they have to interact with or rules they have to enforce, like they really have to be built around people being able to react in emergency situations and any kind of like design flaw in a, in an interface or in um, some rule structuring or command like that can be, can be devastating. And what I find, I guess, really interesting is that I want to kind of tie this back to, I know it's not the same thing, but kind of the Hawaiian crisis, right, where it first came out that it was it was all this human error and that, that was the big problem. Well, it took the des a lot of design community people like Don Norman and Jared Spool to really point out, well, hold on a second here. Sure, the end result was a human error, but where did that really stem from? That was more of a, a design issue, it turned out. Um, and so I wonder if that's what's going on here, because it, in our little blurb from Sky News, I mean, it talks about that this aircraft actually just disappears from radar within two minutes of taking off. And could that just be a systems malfunction from either an ATC scope or something going on in the cockpit? There's just a, there's a whole lot of variables there. Um, but human error, I, f I feel like it's going to relate more to design again um, versus just kind of handing it off to somebody making a mistake. But you never really know. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, it's really difficult to tell. And again, I was really hoping that we'd have a little bit more details to go off of. But if it was human error, two minutes after the plane takes off, that seems like it's pretty quick. Again, I'm no expert on aviation. It's definitely not my field of view or, or my field of interest um, but or, or, or specialty, rather. But uh, um, I don't know. Do you, do you have any sort of ideas of what kind of things could happen within the first two minutes of flight? Are there like it, the only thing that I could think of happening? And again, I am not an expert. I've only done very limited research when it comes to air traffic control. But the only real thing I can think of is a mal malfunction in the actual cockpit itself to where maybe it either if it dropped all systems or something like that. And if this only happened within two minutes of taking off, um, it sounds like it was just more of a, for lack of a better phrase, kind of a freak accident. Uh, likely because it that, I mean you have to go through so many checks when it comes to like pre-flight before you can even close the doors before you can take right. off like there, there's so there's a, such a long list of things you have to go through that it, ju it just seems kind of like an out of out of nowhere problem yeah I will say in our slack uh, Mateo also brought up the fact that you know this this plane was purchased um, I got to pull up the actual comment here, but the plane was purchased uh, after it was like scrapped for parts or something in um, 
in 2015. So, you know, the, f- the fact that we're, we're sort of recommissioning this plane that has been, um, previously disassembled, I, that's, that's another sort of red flag, I think. Yeah, I, I don't know so much about that, to be honest with you, Nick, because, I mean, helicopters themselves have to be disassembled and reassembled every so many miles. And some of the aircraft that we have, like even some of the more the Boeing aircraft, they're they're really old and they'll have parts rechanged and recommissioned. So I'm, I'm not sure how much that plays into it, especially if it was two years ago. Well, OK, so it, it was because of a shortage of parts. So I'm wondering if, you know, they, they were trying to like massively produce these parts and and uh uh, it just didn't work out or, or what, you know, they sacrifice quality for quantity. And I, I don't know. I, I really just don't know. Yeah. Again, I mean, it's, it's a good point to bring up, but it being like two years ago, I'm assuming parts would still be manufactured over and over, but I, I really don't know when an AN-148 is or how old it is, what kind of aircraft. It sounds like it's a smaller plane um, with only 65 and six crew. Uh, but any, Anyhow, hope, if we hear more news, hopefully we can talk about it next week. But um, goes without saying, hearts go out to everybody's families that were involved and all the employees in the Moscow airport. I know this is a tough one. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, just to follow up, Mateo's been pretty active in our Slack. He's been commenting on this one. Uh, he says, so many airline disasters end up coming uh, back to CRM. Um even some rather badly crippled planes have still been brought down safely when the crew is able to focus logically on the task and actually keep flying the plane. But there is a lot of information overload uh, these days and uh, too much simulator, too much simulator time versus actual flying time is creating more trouble than good. So uh, excellent point. I, I love these discussions on our Slack, by the way, this is, it's just awesome to interact with you guys and, and to pull in these comments on our show, because uh, again, we are just two people, um, and you know, like I said, we are no experts in aviation, uh, and, and it's always nice to get other perspectives on this stuff. So thank you guys for, for commenting on that stuff. Uh, do you want to get into a little bit more, I, I don't know, creepy, happy news? I don't, what is this? Yeah, let's lift the hearts a little bit, but right. get a little weird at the same time. Uh, okay, so the process of making a Disney park feel live is easily encapsulated in animatronic figures, right? But not every animatronic, every animatronic in the park can be a simple pneumatically connect, connected to a master system or highly advanced and complex robot masterwork. That's where the little, I'm going to say this wrong, but VLU come in. This project began to help populate the park with more interactive elements. And the VLU are actually three small alien creatures in a self-contained pod that renders them actually autonomous. The mood's... They have moods that interact with guests through nonverbal gestures and cues and are powered by completely on bo- a completely onboard system that can be tuned quickly and left to do its thing on its own. Now, I feel like I either haven't been to Disneyland in a long time or I just wasn't paying attention, but I didn't realize there was that many animatronic things running around the park outside of, I guess, just rides themselves. Yeah, uh, yeah, man, you got to go take another look at this thing. I mean, this, this thing is, uh, from the Marvel cinematic universe and it's particularly, it is a, um, let's say a bird like creature that people can interact with while they're waiting in line for guardians of the galaxy. And it, it, did you watch the video on this thing? Oh, I did. It was, it was pretty entertaining to watch them. And it, I don't know, even it being like something from Marvel and you know, it's not real. They just seem like they have so much personality and it's a robot. They, they really do. And I mean, I, I'm going to call it now. We're going to see this technology. Porgs are going to be hanging out in the Millennium Falcon, and we're going to see this stuff with them because, honestly, to translate this to Porgs from Star Wars, it's going to be a real easy transition. Oh, yeah. It's super, super close. That I was actually going to use that as kind of the analogy for what they look like for mm-hmm. listeners in case they're more fans of Star Wars versus Guardians. Yeah. So, I mean, okay. So, again, the reason why we pulled this story, not just because this is an interesting robotic story, but because this sort of relates to the user experience of going on these rides, right? I mean, how cool is it now that we're at a point where these fictional creatures have basically brought to life and you can interact with them in... in a way that you would interact with a cat or a dog. Uh, I don't know. It just blows my mind. And the, one of the cool parts is kind of the technology behind it, right? Cause they're making a lot of like assertions in the article about how, how much 
networking and complex robotics go into a lot of their animatronics and they're getting to the point where they can just make these things kind of single systems where they can operate on their own. They don't really need to be connected to anything else. They're all good to go based on like the sensors they're given or the cameras they have and the ability for it to just interact with people without somebody to have to like flip a master switch or run a specific log is it's kind of incredible that we've come so far in such a little amount of time. And of course, leave it, leave it to Disney to come out with a really, you know, engaging way to create an experience for people. Yeah. I, I uh, <laughs> yeah. And I, so I'm looking at this sort of controller. You, you mentioned that it's all one system, but it's really neat to kind of see the parameters that you can adjust where you have oblivious to observant and it's on a slider, right? So you can, you can slide this thing and it's a physical controller. It's not like a, it's not like a, um, a computer based system where you can adjust the parameters there. Although I'm sure you could in a pinch, uh, but you have oblivious to observant. That's one gamut. And then you have low energy to high energy. That's another gamut. And then you have a binary choice of introvert and extrovert. And then this last one, I can't see, but the, um, the, the bottom option is critter chooser. It looks binary to me. Can you make that out? Yeah, it's it's definitely a knob, and it's, it says critter chooser. I wonder if that's selecting each particular one. Oh yes, yes, yes. You're right. You're probably it, it probably cycles through the actual yeah, and then you can set the parameters on each one. Man, this is just cool. I I like this. I I like that you can sort of develop these AIs and and modify the parameters live on the fly and kind of see how they react um, to things that guests may do. Yeah, and I don't know. Dude. There's something super either special to me or I just really enjoy the fact of bringing something from either a comic book or a film just to life and making you like for for however long it is, a few minutes make you feel like you're there or make you feel like it's real. It's just it's a it's I don't know. It's always mind blowing. And Disney seems to do a really good job. Yeah. Um, but and, again, the technology behind this is just insane. And they even bring it up in the article, you know, to stay in character is a big part of what they're trying to pull off. And it just, it just works when you have a system that reacts to you. Uh, and, and the fact that they've developed the AI behind this is, is pretty cool to me. Like, and I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to go play with this thing next time I'm at Disneyland. Oh Yeah. You and me both, man. I can't wait to like go back and just see these things. Let's see here. Okay, uh, do you, do you have any other thing? Do you have anything else on this one before we jump into our? I don't know if this is controversial or, but uh, a, a good point of debate argument. Somewhere, yeah, definitely somewhere in the middle. All I can say is I can't wait to see Porg running around like this. Yeah, no kidding. All right, go ahead and jump into the next one. Oh, man. So this is a really cool story. I think it should spark a lot of debate here on the show and also in Slack, too. But anyway, so tech is having a moment of reflection. Even Mark Zuckerberg and Tim Cook are talking openly about the downsides of software and algorithms mediating our lives. And while there have been calls for regulation that are increasingly met by lobbyists blocking any shape or form of rules, some people around the industry are entertaining forms of self-regulation. One idea swirling around, should programmers and data scientists massaging our data sign a kind of digital Hippocratic oath? In fact, Microsoft has released a book last month on the effects of artificial intelligence on society, arguing that it could, it could make sense to bind coders to a pledge that take it, like that taken by physicians to do no harm first. In San Francisco on Tuesday, dozens of data scientists from tech companies, governments, and nonprofits gathered to start drafting an ethics code for their profession. So this is really, this is obviously a controversial topic, but I think it speaks high volumes that a lot of this is coming from, you know, Facebook and Apple who make so much money off of just software and algorithms and integrating them into our everyday lives. I agree. Uh, yeah, that's one part of it. And I I almost... No, I'm going to bring the discussion to um, research as well. I'm going to bring the discussion to research because you can massage data. You can manipulate variables to get a p-value of less than 0 0.05, which is... The p-value is bullshit, whatever. But the fact is that you are reporting on these things that could... That are potentially false if you're manipulating some things that 
that uh, alter the data in a way that's going to benefit you because you want to get published. Um, and I think, yes, it's absolutely crucial when you look at it from the research perspective, um, especially in the social sciences, because that's where you can massage them a little bit more and, and sort of get more. Uh, I, I don't know. It's easier to get a P value if you manipulate it in certain ways. But I, I mean, taking taking, I don't know, man. When it comes to data science, I agree that some steps should. Yeah, don't do don't do any harm. But I, mm, what if you develop a system that then? I'm getting into the singularity side of things. But what if you did? What if you develop a system that decides that it wants to do harm? Are 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 you then breaking the oath? Uh, potentially, yeah, but I think that gets into having more complex, you know, algorithms at that point. I think, I think we're such early stages for how we're designing these things that people are catching, are getting the idea that maybe that'll happen in the future, but what happens if we don't stop it now or don't like put some kind of, some kind of, uh, let's see some ethics or some boundaries in place before that even starts coming along. Cause yeah, I mean, if you want to go down the Ray Kurzweil road, th this stuff is just going to grow so fast that before we know it, it, it'll be doing whatever it wants to. If you're, if you like to look at things that way, but I think this is just trying to understand like at early stages, what can we do with some of these algorithms we're integrating into people's like phones or Facebook. And, and I mean, we're, we're talking about a guy who's had, it, when we're talking about Facebook, at least we're talking about somebody who's had people that worked under him come out and say, like, we've created basically a, a giant dopamine machine. And so realizing the effects of that um, makes people want to, you know, take steps to try, try and regulate it. But honestly, Nick, I feel like this is very difficult to even try and do. Yeah, I agree, because, I mean, you're not going to go to every single coder in the world and have them sign a piece of paper that says, I will do no harm, and then how do you track it back? I don't know. I'm kind of... I just don't know what to think about this, right? Like, my gut check is yes. But then you have instances like the Strava story that we talked about last week on the show where, you know, it's it's not like they were intentionally trying to um, call out military bases, it's just in, it's just a uh, side effect of them collecting data and having it being released, and it's these. It comes back to that that conversation we had last week about these unintended unintended consequences of your data usage and like what what if that data is doing harm, but you don't necessarily intend for it to do harm, you know, cause that's, that to me is the gray area. The, 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 the argument about Facebook it, it creating the dopamine machine, that's very cut and dry to me. Don't do it. But the, the whole middle ground here where sure your intent wasn't to do harm, but really uh, it, it, it ended up doing it anyway, based on something that you created. So it's like, I don't know cuz like how does that how does that happen with um with doctors today right like if you accidentally uh murder somebody and but your your intent was to save their life is it malpractice i mean it, it's Yeah i mean it, it, it that's that's got a whole set of rules that are kind of in themselves very tough right like that right. you you're, you've got a room full of people in an OR but if somebody dies it's up to the surgeon cuz the surgeon is king in that room so it, that's got its own kind of set of problems, I think. And this gets really tough because even with Facebook, that there's some cut and dryness to, you know, what they've done, creating the, the addictive behavior. But I mean, there, there's a line in the article talking about accidentally al allowing like Russian disinformation to be spread. Well, I think that's that's an immediate jab at Facebook. And I mean, there was no there's no reason that the Facebook was like, oh, yeah, let's get behind this. I mean, it, it was purely not knowing that it was either fake news or it was being done maliciously. Like in this case, how do you who's the who's at fault here? Um, yeah, I agree. It, yeah, and it's... then the same thing happens. Like w the one that worries me the most is when, when we're like using algorithms to decide people's fate, whether it's like who was it, who was at the fault in a car accident who was in the wrong in criminal sentencing the algorithm gets to sentence you that kind of stuff is where i think these kind of algorithms make a lot of sense but but again how do you really police this um 
And maybe it's just me having such a lack of understanding of what goes into development of such serious technology like deep, like AI or even deep learning neural networks. But I, I don't know. I th- um, on one hand, I think it's a great idea, right? Like you should you should try and take some responsibility for what you're designing. It's kind of it's kind of akin to when you build a website or a web app. You should you know adhere to accessibility guidelines so everybody has access to it. Um, and in, th- in this case, it's making sure you're not programming something or massaging data in a way that's going to be for some kind of nefarious use. Okay, Blake, bottom line, do you think data scientists and researchers should have to adhere to their own Hippocratic Oath? Uh, their own Hippocratic Oath? Sure. Yeah. It, some kind of mandated one? I I don't know, because I think you're, well, you're some right sort on of... the money with the gray area. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about this digital Hippocratic oath that that they're referencing in the article. Oh yeah, I, I definitely think you should. Any kind of scientist should hold themselves to a pretty high standard. That's that's my opinion. That's mine too. Okay, great. Uh, do you have any other closing thoughts on this one? No, I don't. Okay, well, let's thank all of our friends over at Sky News, TechCrunch, Wired, and. Uh, wearable for all of our stories this week if you guys want to follow along uh you can follow us all over social media or or you can join us in slack and that link is in our show notes uh we post all the original articles as we find them and uh special bonus to our slack listeners we have a lot of good discussion um especially from the strava story last week so let's get into our last story of the week Man, okay, so for all of you guys who are watching the Olympics, this is a pretty fun one. So Samsung has actually carved out a reputation for being one of the most experimental tech giants out there, and now its innovation has actually moved to the to Olympians. So Samsung's created the Smart Suit, which is a piece of smart clothing that's able to provide Olympic short track speed skaters with insights into their own training. Each Smart Suit has about five sensors that deliver a real time look at the wearer's body position and communicate that position back to their coach's smartphone with metrics to help teams alter their training based on the data that their coaches receive. Nick, I I can only imagine that stuff like this is going to just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's, it's cool that it's in the Olympics and I see like applications to, of course, you know, big American sports like football or basketball. Um, But the cool part is this was all done in training in real time, giving feedback that you can actually, you know, make changes to the things you're doing wrong before you hit the big play, big game or the big race, whatever it is. That part's cool to me too, right? So they have these systems for virtual reality where you can map your body to a, uh, a virtual environment and you can kind of see in real time your body movement and posture. And, you know, it's very, it's very illuminating to kind of look in this virtual mirror, if you will, and see that you're slouching or see that your, your gait is a little bit off. Uh, and, and you can try to correct it live in real time. And I feel like that's, that's kind of what they're going for here, except for um, this is a coach looking at their data and saying, your left leg is a little bit too far out, bring it in, you know, and, and they can sort of comment on their posture as they're doing this live. Um, because often in times in, in situations like the Olympics where you are, um, in these high intensity environments that require a lot of focus, just having a a little, uh, voice in your ear that is your coach, um, watching your data can, can definitely help. Right. So, uh, and, and it looks like, um, you know, they can they can even send vibrations to the suit to to kind of give them um, cues. Right. So like to straighten out to, to straighten out your technical flaw or something. So I, I don't know. I think it's a really cool application. And like you said, it, this is the beginning. And sure, it's Olympics. But as as technology uh, expands and advances, American football uh, will probably pick up on this because they get all the fun stuff first. Yeah, but all, honestly, Nick, and I, I really hope this comes to be sooner than later. The this is really cool that this is in sports training. I feel like it's going to help a lot of a lot of athletes or a lot of people to go and train and do hard exercise to maybe correct form and all that kind of good stuff if you have a coach around. But I hope that this kind of technology makes it into your everyday wear because more and more I find myself like sitting in my laptop and. I'll go for hours on in, either building a prototype, making code, writing something, and then realize how hunched over I am and how slouchy I am and how bad my shoulders hurt. That I see something like this really be, being able to kind of 
understand your habits and how your body is fitted to be able to give you these kind of vibrations to like, hey, you need to straighten this part of your shoulder or something like that. Yeah, I was uh, I was going to comment with next step is AI coaches where um, it can detect things like that, right? And and not just uh, not just posture because that's relatively easy to measure, right? Just just the arch of your back, but but more along the lines of um, more complex movements and, uh, and you know if you have um, if you're, if you're working out in the gym or something and you're doing squats and your form is bad and it can like sort of correct you by, uh, giving you signals. I, I, that stuff is exciting to me. Oh yeah. Cause it just, it makes the, the world of kind of fitness and all that, just that much more accessible and easy to kind of go to the gym and take your AI assistant with you. Because I mean, uh, if I had some, I wish I could have a coach all the time, like telling me how to do deadlifts. But if I can have my phone telling me how to do it, I mean, that's the next next best thing. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, do you have any other closing thoughts on this one? I just, uh, I hope we see this in a lot more sports. Uh, that's that's kind of it. I would love to try one of these out because it, it looks like it's not just you know like an upper body thing. It's like on your legs and everything. I'd love to know what it feels like and understand like what's going on as far as how the is the coach making all the decisions or is the, you know, app kind of suggesting, Hey, it looks like this guy's leg is in the wrong position. You should do this. Uh, all cool stuff to come. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, what do you say we get into Reddit? Yes, sir. Let's do it. It came from. It came from. It came from Reddit. That's right. Let's switch gears and get to it came from Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community is talking about. Any subreddit's fair game as long as it relates to human factors and encourages discussion among the community, which is you guys. All right, Blake. Well, we got time for two of them today. So I'm thinking one and three. I'm curious as to what you're thinking here. I like it. Let's do one and three. All right. So let's go ahead and get into one here. Uh, th- this one's titled, uh, Boss says that only tests and research with 100,000 plus visits is statistically true. Help. <laughs> and this Help one, indeed. I know, right? What the hell? Uh, this is in the user experience. Subreddit uh, posted by, oh, I'm going to mess this up. Stare Apprentice. Yes, I did it. Okay. Uh, Stare Apprentice goes on to write, hi, guys. I wanted your advice on your advice on something. I've been conducting user interviews, usability testing, and A/B tests to try to improve a website I'm working on. User interviews and usability testing are usually dismissed in favor of mass online surveys because only five to thirty people can be used uh, can't be used to improve a product. I tried to point out that many UXers including the guy who wrote Don't Make Me Think, find that five to seven users for usability testing is the perfect number. This doesn't work. With A-B testing, it's the same issue of scale. My boss found a website that says anything below 100,000 visitors is not statistically significant. The issue is that to get to that number for some tests, we'd have to leave them up for a full year or more, and we simply can't wait that long. I would argue to test and improve the site. Um, Help. (laughs) <laughs> question mark <laughs> has anyone else encountered this research scale skepticism before what do you do oh man blake i don't even know where to start with this i feel really bad for this person yeah so i pulled this one on purpose like that because i i just i it, at the very least i want him to know that from another a human factors professional who stepped into ux like this one hundred thousand plus visits to give you something statistically true that doesn't make a whole lot of sense um so if at the very least I'm right there with you, man, this is, this sounds like a really tough thing. Cause I tried to, I really tried to think about this today. Like wh- where does that number come from and who put it out there? If you happen to listen to this stair apprentice, please let us know what website this is from. Cause the only thing I could even think of was that, okay, if a company is at such a scale that you've got such a diverse set of users. Okay. Maybe, but even still that doesn't, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And especially if you've done user interviews, usability testing, and you're running a B tests, like that's a lot of data to go off of. I mean, if that's, if you're only doing five to seven people for those three things, we're talking like somewhere, somewhere in the 21 people range. That's, that's a lot for, you know, what sound, what sounds like an actual, small business running with a website or something like that, or maybe more if you guys are looking at a hundred thousand plus visits. Um, 
The only thing that I could I can really think of is can if you're going to continue having usability interviews, tests, or doing A/B tests, like I would. There's two things I would do. I would try to understand is the is it your boss coming at you this way because he there's something that you're telling him needs to be changed that he is married to because if that's the case your your life is just going to be tough and you're going to have to keep throwing data at him um another avenue to go to is every time you do one of these interviews or usability tests or you're like running an ab test and you collect the data try and have him you know just be a fly on the wall especially for the user interview user interviews and usability testing and if you're walking into this particular um particular scenario like know the things that your team has agreed upon you need to you're trying to figure out what problems you're trying to assess and make sure he's aware of them too so if you hear if you hear things that are like well this this part of the website or the navigation is just not great i don't really know where to go and that's a hot button issue he'll have to have heard it firsthand so hopefully that one hundred thousand visitors thing will go away Uh, but honestly man you're you're kind of just in a hard spot it seems like yeah i mean Okay, I'm trying to collect my thoughts here. So it, uh, I kind of agree with the top post on this, the, the top comment on this that says, your boss is an idiot, sorry. Because really, the, so I'm, I'm just going to spitball here. One way you can get around this is implement the design. Um, if you have behind-the-scenes metrics on this website, implement the design. And let that design speak for itself, right? If, if users accomplish their goals and, and spend less time on the site, that means they're they're able to get through it quicker. And there's, there's a bunch of online tools that I won't get into for uh, websites and, and ROI. But, but sort of measuring the effect of these changes that you are arguing to make. Uh, and, and another Redditor here brings up the... Um, effect size right so it, it the effect size is different from the uh the sample size and even though the effect size may be larger with a smaller sample you still have to prove that and so it's like just i i i i'm at a loss for this one man it's like just ask your boss to give you a chance just like let me prove it let me let me pr- I don't know because it, it comes back to what you were saying Blake like if this is a really big company where they they sort of can't do these micro changes um, or incremental changes based or or experiment with them at least but if you can do it I I just don't understand I don't understand this frustrates me to no end I feel I feel s- like all the pain though stare apprentice I feel it yeah, I mean, I would, I would actually love to talk to them if they're, because if they're doing A B tests, that means that there's, there's some version of changes out there, and if one was better than the other, like how can that not be enough information to tell you, like, hey, we should go with A versus B, or something like that. The, the only other piece of advice that I have is, and, and I don't know what size team you, excuse me, are working on or how big your company is. If you're an army of one, this won't help you. But the only thing I could think of is if you're Sounds like you're pretty much in charge of a lot of the user experience and or user experience research. I mean, talk to developers, talk to product managers, talk to people in marketing. Try and like convince them, be like an evangelist for yourself, saying like, guys, I'm seeing all of this data based on tests that we're doing, but it's not enough for the boss. I mean, can, do you do you see what I'm seeing? Can you give me reasons why there we just can't make changes? I mean, really form a cohesive group to try and I'm, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what else to say, but kind of break your boss down a little bit. Cause this doesn't make any sense. This 100,000 vid- visitors. I mean, again, you could be talking about such a scale that all right, fine. But still, I mean, even at, at that scale, I mean, you mentioned then mentioned Krug who wrote, don't make me think. And like another book that I read from grad school, same thing. Five to seven users gives you some amount of information. If you've got more than that, I mean, you're you're good. You should be able to make decisions. Yeah, to piggyback off of that, I would I would, and I'm sure you just try to provide that same rationale that a lot of these big names in the field do for for such a small sample size, right? If you can say that. The, I mean, the, the the rationale is often written out 
in these books and on these websites that say, you know, five to seven people will give you an idea of what's going on and what you need to change. And um, they usually provide a rationale as to why that's enough. And if you can sort of use that rationale to your boss and, and get him on board, then you're good. Um, another thing you can do is, um, and now I, I don't advocate this as a way to conduct user research. I do not. Not one bit do I advocate this. But I'm going to say it because it may help in this specific situation. I, I hate even suggesting it. But what you could do is write a survey that says, would you, you, would you prefer an interface that had these features versus these features? And if it comes back, uh, chances are if it's a good feature chain feature change or i mean it's harder to measure for for little changes in design that just make it easier right as a human factors thing but uh, man i don't know because because then you could get your sample size you could prove your boss and 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 it'll be fine but uh man this one's a tough one this is this one's a really tough one all I got to say, man, is good luck to you, Stare Apprentice. But if your boss won't listen to the fact, I mean, you say this in the Reddit post, if you won't listen to the fact that paying attention to the research you guys have already done, which sounds like you've done three very different types and good types of user experience research or human factors methodology, but if he won't listen to the reason that the return on investment is much better than going for a full year of deployment with these kind of tests, then... I, I don't know if there's anything that'll ever convince him because that's insane to try and run like a full year test. That's like some academia stuff. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, my my last line of defense is get another job. Find someone who's going to trust your opinion and, and who knows what to do because this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. Yeah, there's really no way to tackle it. I was trying to just skirt around it, but I agree with Nick. Like if, if he really won't pay attention and you're obviously in the in the right I think get another job. You're obviously a smart guy <laughs> or girl. Smart, smart person. Seriously. All right. Let's get into this last Reddit post here. Uh, have you switched your team over to Agile? And how long did it take it? And how long did it take? And how did it go? Uh, this one is also in the user experience subreddit by Blueberry Quick. Um, they go on to write, I was recently hired on a UX uh, on as a UXA to help transition an established retail team over to Agile. I'm currently working alongside a consultant who handled the initial transition and was hired with another UXA. But after this week, we are on our own to make it forward, to move it forward. The company is firmly entrenched in the way we've always done it. And while some are open, many are skeptical. We ran a design sprint this week, which went well. But I overheard more than a few, this is my fifth sprint type things, to which I should have asked, how are they working for you? My boss and his boss are 100% all in, very excited about it, but his boss is disengaged and maybe even a little cynical. I know this will be a challenge, but my great fear is that I will grow cynical too. Take the paycheck and wa wake up every day feeling useless. How did you stay positive and what are your tips for remaining on track when each product owner just wants their timelines met to hell with the others blake uh do you want to jump into this one first because i got some thoughts uh yeah i'm i am going to jump into this i'm just gonna okay. say that i am not the i'm <laughs> i'm not somebody to completely base all of, all of your choices on but if you ever get to the point where i'm gonna quote you if you are just taking the paycheck and wake up feeling useless every day uh, quit and find something get else. Get another to do. job. Yeah, get another job. <laughs> That's like, our advice for this some, week. Something else. I do not want you feeling like that. I've felt like that before, and it's awful. And you'll you'll just stay there and stay there. And it doesn't make any sense. So do something else for sure. Now, getting into the have you had a team switch over to agile problem? Yeah, I, and it it takes a long time because I and Nick, you'll be able to elaborate a lot more on this than I can now, but. I, f I feel like it just takes a whole lot of time for people to really get their heads around, okay, we need to switch from whatever model we were doing into Agile, but we don't really know how to do it. We know some of the steps we're supposed to do. We're supposed to hold these sprints and use points to allocate u for user stories, but it's really just kind of going through the motions, almost doing the same thing they were doing before, but putting different names on it. So I, I totally can 
uh, I can feel what you're talking about with just different PMs or like, screw everybody else. I just need to meet my timelines. And that happens a lot, especially when you're dealing with multiple contracting parties on one team because they're everybody's out for themselves. Um, the, the best advice I can give, and it's not, it's not great advice, is I would look to bring in somebody who is a super duper expert and agile from outside the company and help bring them in to help you figure it out. Um, you can also read, like there's a couple of great books on agile. Um, it depends on what style you like, but one that has gotten a lot of popularity, um, especially if you have like a design heavy company, if you're building products constantly is sprint by Jake Knapp. It's the guy from Google. They came up with like basically the one week sprints. Um, the only thing I can tell you is keep trying because I, I worked on a project years ago now where we were constantly in this trying to get our agile like shit together and it would it just ran into we had people that were old school and like stuck to the waterfall model and didn't want to change and it, it the only turning point for everybody on the team was when another te- another separate team within that company had a, had somebody who became an agile expert and they literally coached us through how you run a sprint, how you meet deadlines, what happens if you can't meet them, how user stories are supposed to be written, how they're supposed to work, how you allocate points based on design, development, um, general technical problems. Like it's, it's just one of those things that it's, it's, I think it's hard to learn and it's, it's certainly hard to learn on an individual level and then implementing it across many people with different backgrounds is it's just a process yeah i agree um i want to speak to sort of i don't really have a whole lot more to add to what you said blake uh there are a lot of resources out there um and and sort of the biggest part is coming together as a team and understanding that you know everyone is trying to figure it out and you're not going to get it right the first time that's why it is an agile process you're not going to get it right the first time that's okay revisit it in a later sprint um but i will say here your last sort of paragraph sort of hints at how do you stay positive and what are your tips um for uh remaining on track when each product owner just wants their timelines met well if you can it all comes back to that evangelizing your role if you can evangelize your role and show its importance um sort of get in with the teams that are going to be implementing your designs and say hey look i would really appreciate it if you could build in x amount of time or x amount of story points or whatever you're using for you know user user facing stuff and don't don't try to be your own thing don't try to be your own thing because you'll rely on other groups that will have to implement that. And so if you can just come to the table and say, look, let me work with you to make this 100% better. Eventually you'll get, you'll get better and better at, at uh, informing their design and, and getting ahead of things um, and knowing what's coming up to where there's, there's less and less work on their hands and they'll come to appreciate it. And, and really that's all I have to say is, just try to get them to acknowledge you and to incorporate just a little bit of time. Not, don't ask for much um, and scope it. Scope it in a way that, that's going to give you rewarding work and that's going to um, also make the product the best it can be for the sprint that you're on. So, you know, and again, it comes back to the thing. It comes back to what I said earlier. If you can't get it right the first time, it's okay. It's agile. You can come back to it later. That's all I got to say on it. Most definitely, man. The the last point I have, and I know I'm a chatty Cathy on these today. It's okay. But the uh, the one thing that I that you obviously have going for you is you seem to have identified people that are actually open to this in your company, and I agree with what Nick said. And I would focus on those people, like having you don't even have to have like structured meetings, like going into their office and talking about it, and then. F- brainstorming ways together that you can actually try and make this proliferate for your through your company because that the the mantra of this is the way we've always done it we're going to continue to do it that way you'd be surprised how many places are like that but if you if you really just take a step back and think about it that's why they bother hiring people they they want them to come into the company and bring something that wasn't there before where they want to change all their the ways they used to do things Probably not, but if you know that it's going to benefit the company and you can and you've got some people that can get behind you and you can show how it's going to impact your products, your bottom line, your 
whatever your boss, the way your boss treats the rest of the employees, like you, you have a job that you can do. And there's obviously people there who believe in it too. And it's just a matter of going and doing it and struggling and getting to the end of it. All right. On that note, let's get out of here. So that's going to be it for today, everyone. Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. Did you like them? Did you hate them? Did you find them interesting? I did. Let us know. If you have any suggestions for topics or news stories that you think we may have missed, you can uh, follow us all over social media. Uh, you can join our discussion on Slack. Like I said, link is in the show notes. Or you can head on over to the Human Factors Cast LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. Be sure to check out our SoundCloud and leave us a comment over there. We love hearing from you. Or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you're feeling saucy, leave us a voicemail, 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. If you'd like to support us financially, you can do that at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Uh, we'll have some surprises here in the next couple weeks, so stay tuned for that. Uh, if you don't want to support us financially, I understand. I understand. We're making changes, but it's okay. You can still review us, like, subscribe, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, whatever your favorite podcast directory is. We love those, and it helps spread the word about Human Factors. And really, that's how we're growing, is because you guys are giving your word of mouth to your friends and family who are Human Factors practitioners and letting them know about the show, and we appreciate that almost more than money. So (laughs) do that for us. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnstorf for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about agile development? Oh, God. If you guys want to talk about agile development, I'll try my best. But you can always find me on Twitter at Don't Don't Panic UX. And now you can also find me on YouTube at Don't Panic UX as well. What are you doing on YouTube? I just want to plug you really quick. Uh, I am doing a podcast called The UX Rant. And I'm also just doing miscellaneous tutorials on design and web development. Go check out Blake on YouTube. Uh, he's got some really great, great episodes up. And it's really fun. It's like it's like hanging out with him on the weekend He's, he's drinking coffee and beer and, and just answering UX stuff. It's ranting. And now I'm ranting. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again, guys, for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. It depends. All right, Blake, let's bring it home. <laughs>